Hello everyone, this is Dan. Uh, Welcome to the Spiritual Underground Podcast. Uh, This is a group of guys that have had a spiritual awakening. Uh, We're a bunch that who are seeking a better connection with each other and a deeper connection with what we like to call the fourth dimension. Uh, We do want to make sure you understand we are not trying to be experts. We simply practice this deal on a daily basis. Uh, We don't profess to know the path to spirituality. We just know what has worked for us and we want to share that with other folks. I do want to say that this podcast is not affiliated with any group or organization. Uh, We just ask you to sit back and relax as as this little group here shares some juice. Uh, This podcast comes to fruition and uh, over um, really just shooting the shit sessions and wondering if what we're saying is uh, worth putting down on tape. Uh, We we beat it around actually for a while, and and in a little group text thing, uh, it actually kind of bloomed. Uh, the word podcast come out one guy said yeah let's do it and the next thing you know we're meeting at a coffee shop talking about doing this thing our hope is uh, that this this level of recovery that we uh, I hesitate to say found but this level of recovery we found here is something that other people out there are hungry for too Uh, we 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 see a need for it and uh, so today today we're just going to talk about uh the genesis of this podcast, what we're doing, what our purpose is, and, uh, and, and each one of us are going to go around the room and share a little bit about what we're doing. Uh, today we have Nick with us, uh, Shane, and Schmitty, and uh, I'll just go ahead and toss the mic over to Schmitty. How's it going? Um, I think one of the main things that we're really trying to do here is share just the way, what we've learned over however long we've 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 been doing this thing to to share it with anybody whether or not you are actively searching for any kind of spiritual grounding in your life or if you're struggling from any kind of addiction um also on top of that um you know we're we we have a lot of uncertainty about a lot of things right now we're not really sure exactly what we're going to do but we do know that we feel like what we have is worth sharing and uh that's the most important part really is making sure that what we have is given to as many people as possible cuz we feel like we were lucky to to kind of be put into uh a group of people that uh uh, have reached a certain level. I don't know about, I don't know if you'd call it a level of, of, uh, like we're above anybody, but we've just found something that works for us and gives us a level of satisfaction in life to where we're able to help other people and they're able to help us. I mean, one of the big things for me with this is just getting to know my friends better. Um, getting to know, uh, everybody that I already am and uh, am together with a, a decent amount, and getting to know them deeper because these conversations are gonna probably pull out some stuff, and I feel like it's twofold. It's to to learn to 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 get to know each other better, and also to be able to spread what we have to as many people as we can. And if you're listening to this wherever you are, wherever in the world you are. You can sit there and go, yeah, I thought like that too. I felt like that also. And uh, how do I how do I get to a point where I can uh, have more um, satisfaction in life? Not necessarily following selfish things, following you know the next the big you know the the new car, the bigger house, or the better job, or whatever it is, but to find uh, something meaningful that you can share with other people. So uh, that's where I'm coming from. So, Thanks, Smitty. Uh, full disclosure, Smitty's sort of a, uh, a mentor to me, so uh, I enjoy being on mic with him today. Uh, this is Nick. Uh, for me, I'll tell you what, when I first de- decided to become willing to accept some sort of recovery in my life, I was broken, broken. And I grew up with religion, and I'm not going to sit here and say that it's religion's fault that I got to where I was, but religion didn't work for me. I needed spirituality. And you'll, you'll hear in our stories a lot about spirituality, and you'll hear a lot about juice. And those two things are pretty 
uh, important to every guy that you're going to hear on these mics. When I first came into the rooms, I was pretty down on myself for being an alcoholic and an addict. I hated, I hated those terms. I didn't want that. But as my path continued, I'm sitting here today and I'm legitimately grateful that I'm an alcoholic and an addict because I found this path of spirituality available to me that I probably wouldn't have discovered if I was a so-called normal person. When I say normal person, I mean an alcoholic, someone who's not an alcoholic or an addict. And when I talk about my path to recovery, my spirituality to a lot of my friends, one of the things I hear the most often is, I wish I had something like that for me. And a lot of times when I'm talking in, in a meeting or in a group, we hear a lot of people say, man, there's a lot of people out there that could use this sort of recovery. And that is why I wanted to bring this. I wanted to bring this in a way that people who aren't alcoholics and addicts could look at some of the concepts that are common in recovery. The 12 steps, uh, that's, that's literature of AA. Th- those things can, can translate to a lot of different people out there. So that, that, that's really my form of uh, wanting to do this is to be able to bring that juice that we have to people outside of the addict and alcoholic world. What is juice, Nick? To, to me, juice is just the... I, today, I feel, I feel higher in those spiritual moments than I did when I was using. That, that's juice to me. Um, living in the moment can be juice. Uh, I I get a lot more enjoyment out of being a dad than I ever did being a drunk druggie. Um, But I wouldn't be there without the spirituality that I was given through recovery. But you don't have to be, you know, my problems are pretty obvious. I got fired from a job because I passed out on my desk in the middle of a dinner rush. I'm a chef. In the middle of a dinner rush, my, my, my problems were obvious. Some of you guys out there might not have such obvious problems. You might spend too much money shopping. You might eat a little too much. You might break into these cycles of being lazy. These aren't obvious problems. They're not killing you like my problems were killing me. But at a certain point, I think everybody hits that moment where they sit and say, hey, could my life could be a little better. I could be happy. Money is not buying me happiness. What can? Well, juice can buy you that happiness, in my opinion. Shane, do you have any thoughts, bud? Thank you, Nick. Uh, Shane here. Um, I'm sitting in a group of guys here that have all been mentors to me. I'm sitting here two day, two years and one day sober and clean. Uh, if I would have been two years and one day ago, you tell me I'm sitting here talking into a mic. Yeah, right. Uh, I can't talk in front of people. I wasn't able to talk in front of people. I was scared to death my brother would ever get married and I'd have to say a speech in front of people that I know let alone strangers but um since I got into recovery and the 12 steps um man it's changed my life and early early on I I mean I just knew it was something special and the world needed to to see it and and feel it and do it um it'd be a better place with it and um yeah it's (laughs) it's pretty amazing um I'm actually really nervous right now, and I can be honest about that with these guys. Um, I met these guys uh, about a year and a half ago, and I walked in the room, and I could feel something different when I walked into that room. And uh, I wanted more because I'm a seeker. I always want more of something, and I wanted what those guys had. And it was a spiritual connection that I didn't have. I didn't have a spiritual connection with uh, God of my understanding growing up with the one I was taught. So... um, once I got in here and they told me that I could have my own conception of a higher power, um, that changed my life because I was born um, to where and raised where, you know, um, God was a vengeful, wrathful God, and I was going to hell, you know, for everything I did. So I was like, what am I, I going to do now? I'm fucked, you know? So, um, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, when I when I first came in, and um, my wife knew something was wrong with me, and she was trying to 
trying to get me to get up off the couch and do something because I was just a a shell of a person anymore. I had no life in me left. I had uh, no life left, really. I mean, I thought I'd accomplished everything in life that I was supposed to do, you know. I had the wife, the kids, the house, the car, the business, the boat, all the things I thought would make me happy, and I wasn't happy. Um, but today, I still have those things, thank God, but um, that's not what makes me happy today. This right here, what I'm doing right now, makes me happy and full of that juice they're talking about. I get higher off this than any drug or drink could ever do for me in this life. And I want more. I want more of what is so freely given to me. And I want to pass that on to the next person and uh, so they can pass it on to the next. Had you ever tried to get sober before you met us? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, through myself, my you know, doing it myself, you know, I uh, I would go on vacation, and it just so happened I would uh, my I would get my script of 180 hydrocodone tins uh, the day of uh, our departure for a vacation. And I'd be like, all right, I gotta I gotta make these last through the week and, and just wing myself off these things because 180 would last me three days here, so um, at the at the at tops, and then I would have to buy them off the street at eight dollars a piece. So um, that was a hefty bill I was doing for a year at that many. And before that, it was about 40 a day. But um, I, I tried myself, and when we go on those vacations, I'd be like, all right, I'm going I'm to just take a few of these and make it last through the week and just get off these things. But I would drink heavily. So the first, right after that first one I would take, it started that phenomenon of craving. I was like, well, the faster I take them, the faster I can quit. So I might as well hit them harder. So it only t- last me two days. And then I would just wake up in the morning and fill my Yeti full up with uh, vodka and a splash of Red Bull and uh, go about my day. And my wife would be like, why are you drinking so much? And I was like, I'm on vacation, you know. So, <laughs> oh, man, yeah, I-, I tried many times. And by the end of the week, I- I- that phenomenon of craving from the drugs would be going away. But as soon as I was on my way back, I knew they were there. And so I would be on the phone with my drug dealer having them put them in, in, in the cooler on my back porch or in my mailbox or wherever for me. And if I got home and they weren't there, man, I was I was going off, and I was going to find him, and I was going to go find what I needed. Um, yeah, it was a sucky way of life. It, that's, it ruled my life. But, yeah, once I came in and found the 12 Steps and surrendered to this program of 12 Steps, man, my life has never been the same. And it, he lifted a phenomenon of craving from me immediately. That's awesome. Cool, man. Thanks, Shane. Thanks to everybody. Uh, that's one time around. I'm going to share a little bit on uh, on the same kind of uh, concept there. That, that And, and, and Schmidt had said something about this, like this level. And I hesitate to use that word, too, because I don't want to say that we're at some specific spot on the scale, right? That I'm here and you're there. But when I first came into recovery, and, and, and like what I think at some level Nick was talking to Shane about, was that you know, most of us tried before, and there was something that wasn't really working for me before when I tried this deal. And what I kept on running into, and, and again, I'm not trying to put myself into some other spot, in, in this, into some better than position, but what I was finding was something I felt was very inauthentic when I would look at these people who were teaching me recovery at that point. One of the things I saw was a very... Uh, um, a tight kind of feeling where they they couldn't let loose and like and joke around and let what we say today is let our little kids out to play Uh, i saw it now i didn't know that then but i see that looking back now you know it was just kind of a stuffy atmosphere another thing and i still see that to some level today is a is a um a weird dynamic where like a sponsor a mentor would almost not really want their sponsee to like gain on them uh, keep them down kind of thing you know and and we've seen it today in a way and i and and i and i hesitate big time to, to to again i don't want to be talking down to people but a guy who's wanting to improve the quality of his life in a certain area uh being told that he needed to have one year of recovery before he should try that you know and, and i really hesitate for people to like that holding people down instead of letting them fly uh my sponsor has always encouraged me to like shoot for the stars once once i had worked through the steps that was the uh you know get your rocket shoes on 
and fly. And that's the same way I look at it today. And then when I when I walk around with these rooms and these guys that we talk to on Tuesday nights, that is the energy I see. People who are allowed to let their little kids out to play. People who are willing to like take uh, go out of the comfort zone to do things like we're doing tonight by sitting around these microphones and talking uh, freely into something that may be released into the universe at a level that we don't even understand. Uh, you know, we get together outside of our normal places where we meet. You know, it's 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 and and again, it's to me, it's leveling up in my recovery. It's just almost like a video game, and I'm not even a video guy, but it's leveling up. And constantly wanting to increase that level and that flow of juice in my life. Uh, who wants to go next? I'll, I'll piggyback on that, Dan. Uh, yeah, I, I agree that. I mean, especially you'll you'll probably hear the theme of Tuesday night come out a lot in here, and that's just uh, that's just a place where this group here plugs in our our souls and, and charges those batteries so juice day is yeah we call it juice day so and, and honestly uh back to why we started this thing we're trying to we we feel like at some to some extent we've got lightning in a bottle with that tuesday night deal and with this uh text thread that we have between each other some of my my outside of this group of friends friends when i talk to them about the friendships i have in here they are jealous because we are we are tight like brothers, but we're tight like we get to be little kids together. We get to joke around. There's no stuffiness about us whatsoever. There is no off limit topic for us to talk about, to joke about. Uh, and we're hey, we're human. We still get pissed off at each other. We still uh, have to talk things out, but we have a lot more fun. Uh, for me, you know, continuing on this whole spiritual journey. I, being raised in a very strict legalistic church where it was all about what I can't do. I need somebody to tell me what I can do. Um, when I came into the room, I was, or came, came to meet these guys. I was definitely uh, what I would, I like to call a militant atheist where not only did I not believe, but I wanted to convince you that you were wrong today. I've dropped all that. I'm still, I'm still pretty much an atheist. I, I think at a later date we'll probably get into more of the the higher power stuff and the, that. But the big thing I want to hit today is that you can have spirituality without religion. They are they they don't have to go together. Um, I, when I decided that I was an atheist, though, I threw all that spirituality away. I got I, I thought that those things were together, and so I became real sick. I didn't have anything to fill that hole, and you know, alcohol and and drugs filled that hole. For, pretty well for a long time and uh then all of a sudden it just stopped working it wasn't fun anymore and when it wasn't fun anymore i started getting really down on myself i've I've been reading this quote from carl jung for a while says we cannot change anything until we accept it condemnation does not liberate it oppresses so i had to accept the fact that i needed a spiritual solution that's all i had to do i didn't have to beat myself up because i I personally have a disease, and some of you out there listening might not have that that disease. You might just be sitting here thinking, there's a problem in my life, things could be better. I'm not as bad as that guy. Well, you're probably not. You're probably not as bad as me. But you can use the same tool. If the tools can fix me, can fix Shane, can fix Dan, can fix Chris, then and you're sitting there saying, no, my problem's not that bad. Well, guess what? That tool can fix your problem if it can fix ours. And that that's what... Um, that's what keeps coming me back, keeps me coming back, because I keep getting better. I keep becoming a better man, a better husband, a better father, a better friend. Every time I take this program and use it as a magnifying glass on my life, I spot something that makes me uncomfortable. And when I'm uncomfortable, I need to change something. Uh, so, and then when I change something, on the other side, I'm better for it. So, uh, that's my next thought, I guess. Smitty, you want to jump in on that? Uh, yeah. Uh, a couple things. One, I think that's what Nick brought up was pretty important, is that you know I grew up in uh, the church. Uh, I won't mention which one, but uh, actually they're, they're fairly lenient as far as most of the churches go. And uh, But that word stuffy 
really, I didn't think about it, um, but that's but that's the word I always attributed. And it was because the, the it was funny because the, the the air was literally stuffy in that church. Every time I left, my nose was all dry, and like so, like I not only was it mentally stuffy, but it was but it was physically stuffy. Um, one of the things I remember the most about that was, um, you know, I would look at I was young. And I would look at all these people professing, you know, all these, you know, things about what what God was and what God wasn't, and they they had uh, they all had ideas about, you know, um, what you should do and what you shouldn't do. But then I would see them, you know, and I would look and watch the things they would say that didn't have to do with religion, and I would see, you know, the hypocrisy, and um, that doesn't mean that I'm not a hypocrite because I am. I'm definitely a hypocrite and none of us in this room are perfect in any stretch of the imagination, uh, except for Nick. But, uh, <laughs> actually one of the first things you ever said to me was everybody's a hypocrite. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that it's uh, hypocrisy is not like when somebody calls you a hypocrite. I mean, nobody, there's nobody that should be shocked by that because first of all, in my life, if I don't change anything about myself and believe the same things I believe from day one, I'm not growing. I'm not learning. Um, now, I've been a hypocrite in other ways where I've just literally lied and said that I was, you know, I believed in one thing when I didn't or whatever it is, you know, the, the, just the human part of it. Uh, but that, that going back to that religious part of it, it didn't make sense to me. Uh, I didn't know how to incorporate it in my life. There wasn't action. That's the other thing about it. There didn't seem to be any action. Plus, at that time in my life, I really didn't have a lot of reason to act because I was I was just a kid. But as I grew up and I uh, they paid me, uh, I don't know, like $100 to confirm and say, you know, the words that, you know, I, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And then I haven't been to church since. And uh, I got paid for it, though, so that's cool. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and this is just this is this is the, the, the life that I led at the time. You know, it's just what I was brought up. And my parents are... are um, are fairly religious and they believe in it. And, uh, you know, that makes them, it does it. I don't see them relying on God. I just see them believing in God. And, um, for me, you know, when I heard that, when I hear the world's word spirituality originally, I automatically attribute that to some set doctrine and some set word of, and, you know, like, Oh boy, here we go. You know, the Corinthians, blah, 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 you know? Um, and that's, that was, that's not what I want. And when I first, got in recovery and I heard the word God, I definitely was like, that's for people who are dumb. You know, that's for people who are not smart like me. Meanwhile, uh, I kept, uh, not staying sober. Uh, and so, um, but the other, the other piece, uh, that, that, uh, Nick was mentioning that I wish I could remember what exactly it was, but it was, uh, the, uh, the idea that, um, you know, we go on this this journey on a daily basis, and uh, we're like I said, you know, back the idea of, of perfection. You know, I, I, I well, no, the point that I wrote, the the main thing is when when he said, you know, he was he was uh, uh, passing out, and Shane said the thing about the pills. You don't necessarily have to have something that that uh, extreme, but that person at work that just that you, that you can't stand their voice or your wife or your husband or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or that guy in traffic, all those things take space in your brain and you allow it to take space in your brain and you use it as an excuse to do the things you do. I still today have issues with that. Um, what the big thing is that we've, we've learned is we are not necessarily altered in the sense that we are totally different. We now have a set of tools. We, we, we are now, we have a tool belt full of things that we, ch- we can choose to use if we want, and we can choose to use to feel the pain of, the, of, of not using them. But we also know that they're there. And um, that's the big difference is not necessarily that we are, uh, like, like, you know, we talked about the levels thing. We just have, we just have ways to to break down those situations now and not feed them like we used to harbor things like resentments. You know, it says harboring is taking in and feeding and, 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 and nourishing a resentment, you know, that's what harboring means. And so the idea that we don't do that anymore, we try to get it out as quickly as possible. And that's the most important part to me is 
giving people the idea that they have tools and, um, and that they are, uh, you have these tools, you choose to use them if you want. And if you don't, that's fine. But you know that those tools will work. Uh, so you said the word action. Um, I want to plant a flag right there. What, what, so somebody's, you're on your way here to meet us today and some dumbass cuts you off in traffic. What's, what's the action part of your program that makes that better? Well, I had to do it today. Uh, I literally had to do it today. And it's funny because we were talking about yesterday is, you know, there's, there's in recovery, the, you know, whatever, you know, there, the 12 steps of recovery uh, in the in the tenth step, it, it mentions the idea of doing a, a kind of like a mini fourth step, and the fourth step is and uh, deals with resentments. And there's a there's a, a very specific grid where you go across and you say, okay, uh, the guy in the in the uh, in the red Mustang or whatever cut me off. Okay, that's number one. Two is why are you mad? He cut me off. Three is what it affects in me, and there's a multiple choice. There's your personal relations, your self-esteem, your security, your ambition, and your sex relations. And this is just what, what we've been taught. And I know it affects my security because, you know, I mean, almost hit my car. And uh, it kind of affects my self-esteem because I think I'm better than him. Um, and it might affect my personal relations because, I, I don't know, he, I might work with him. I don't know. Um, and then the fourth column is what I did wrong. And what I did wrong was judge the guy when I used to drink and drive. I used to literally drink and drive and speed and do donuts on golf courses, <laughs> drunk as shit. And so I go through the process of what I'm mad at, what it affects in me, and then I look at my mistake and my reflection of that event, of who I am in comparison to that person. Am I, am I, it'd be one thing if I was like a, a, a perfectly, uh, moral member of society where I never did anything wrong. I don't know that there's too many of those, but I can see somebody being like, he cut me off in traffic. I've never done anything like that. How dare you? But I know I have. And so that's my plan of action when it comes to those things. And, you know, I don't know if we'll ever go through like a, 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 uh, a specific uh, run through what the steps do. Uh, but as far as that goes, that's a, that's, a, that's a good example of how the anger shows up what to do with the anger, and then how not to hold on to the anger. Because the anger is always going to show up because that's just human nature. What do we do with it? How do we process it? That's the most important part because resentments uh, are powerful, and they will, they will force you to alter your behavior like that. But the anger sure would have showed that guy in the Mustang that he was wrong, right? Right. I mean, you know, <laughs> first of all, he doesn't even know what happened. Second of all, you know, I've heard a ton of people saying he doesn't even know what happened. He's living rent free in your head. And uh, you're drinking his poison. You're drinking his poison. He doesn't even, he's probably just, you know, jamming out to whatever song he's listening to. Probably yeah. Creed or something. And he's, and he's in a badass Mustang when you're driving a Miata. Right? I was going to ask, what kind of car were you driving? <laughs> a Mazda 3 Grand Touring edition. Yeah. It's a Grand Touring. Don't it's forget Grand that. You, you What's trip. up, Shane? I know you got something you're thinking. I've seen your wheels turning. And yeah, uh, just they different things I, I, I've heard in, uh, throughout my journey uh, was. The first, uh, let's see here. Let me get it right so I don't mess it up. I sound retarded. Uh, I'm sorry for the words. <laughs> um, a thousand mile journey starts with the first step. And when I took the first step coming into the rooms to, of recovery, I came in and became teachable because the way I was living did not work for me. I had 39 years of misery 39 years of misery, knowing that there was something different with me, something was wrong with me, and didn't know how to fix it, and wanted a cure. And I thought going into um, the nut hut would cure me. And eight days later, um, they were telling me I got to go because I was through with detox. And, you know, I was being cocky and saying, yeah, I got this, I got this. But deep down inside, I was a scared little kid, man, scared to death. What am I going to do when I get back out in this big, bad world and uh, get back to what I can get my hands on? and get that comfort again but a higher power was working through me at the time when I uh, I went in there and I could feel it I could already feel it and I didn't know what it was at the time but because I, I prayed before all this and uh, I 
I never had any kind of connection with a higher power at all. But until I started doing this stuff here, man, um, I, I, I got a connection with them. And when I start praying differently and meditating, you know, I start praying for unselfish things. I started asking him, what can I do for you? You know, my whole life I've been asking, hey, you know, can you do this for me? Can you do this for me? If you had a friend that came to you every day and asked you for something, never once asked you, hey, can I do something for you? Would you want to be friends with him? Hell me, no. Me personally, no. And, and that's the way I treated my higher power uh, up until this point. And once I started asking him, what can I do for you? Things started changing in my life. And he gave me things to do. And I would ask for specific things to do. And he would give them to me. And, um, <laughs> literally, um, there was a, a, a time where um, I was looking for people to help. And I asked my higher power um, to give me somebody to help. And literally, he threw somebody in front of my truck driving down the road by uh, a busy interstate and um I, I saw this guy sitting there and he was on a bike and i thought he was putting air in his tire and as i was going by he just fell out and i was like what is going on i was like he just he's not, there's something wrong so i pulled over real quick and i run over there and i get over and he wasn't putting air in his tire he was huffing um computer cleaner and uh i was like oh and I was trying to get him to come to it, and he was out. I mean, done. So I called 911 and tried to get some help for him. And um, sure enough, the, a, a security car pulled up for the campus I was close by to. And a uh, dude jumps out of the car, runs over to him, and he's like, get out of here, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I put my hand on that guy, and I said, he's my brother. I got this. I didn't know this dude from Adam, but I called him my brother at that time, and I didn't know why I called him my brother. Because nowadays, everybody's my brother. I don't think about just myself anymore. So he, this dude started to come to, and um, it, the, I got the cop to go away, and 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 the and I one just pretty much hung up on me because they knew what it was and they deal with it so much. And uh, he stood up and he's like, "Am I free to go? Am I free to go?" I was like, "Yeah." He's like, but "I was like, but we talked to me." He said, "I gotta go." I was like, "You know why I'm here, right?" He said, "Yeah, God sent you." I said, yes, he did. Will you talk to me? He said, I got to go, but I'll meet you up here at this Denny's. So he got on his bike and took off, and I got in my truck and met him up at that Denny's, and I talked to him and shared some of my experience, strength, and hope with this dude. And um, that was that was a cool moment for me in early recovery because I'd never had anything like it happen before. And I um, felt a love for somebody, just a complete stranger, uh, on a, a street person, really. And... Uh, I still remember his name, but I can't remember it at this moment because I'm just blonde like that. But, you know. Uh. Yes, you are. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how much better you can feel when, when you see everybody just, they're just trying to do the best they can. Mm -hmm. And you give yourself a little bit more grace when you treat other people like that, I think. Yeah, for sure. Dan, you got something? That's a, that's a huge mouthful, and that's a... Uh... You know, one of the things that I was thinking about is, as he was talking, you know, when he was saying you came in here and this surrender thing, but you know, there's a there's an old concept that has been hitting me lately is this whole uh, a concept that used to be used all the time in apprenticeship mentor type of roles and how we came up in our and you know you learn to do stuff from some older usually same sex gentlemen and they would teach you how to operate, you know. And, and although I had a great father, uh, I can't lay, I really am not one of these guys who can actually lay my, uh, my spiritual sickness on my upbringing. And, uh, and as I look around in here, you know, I, I see a, a common thread for the most part in everybody like that. I still didn't really get taught these tools to, that allow me to, uh, there's a little tagline, what, and I think it said like a design for a living that works, right? Some way to actually do it. And then also in a way that I don't have to, uh, I never have to do anything alone again. That was the other little thing that I had in me before I came around to, to, to wanting to get better was that I thought I had to do everything myself. I thought that I couldn't ask for help. Uh, you know, I, that whole concept of I got this. You know, and to be able to throw that down today, and uh, and know that, like when when a, when a, when a gentleman sat across from the table from me, and he gave me full confidence, and I could sit across there. There was a couple of things that was going, on, and I actually shared this last night as I was working with a guy doing the same thing I was taught to do, is uh, is he told he gave me confidence that this thing was going to work out if I would just do what he said to do, 
you know, and I didn't, you know, in the back of my head, my wheels are turning and, and they're saying, no, that doesn't work. I must control this. I am, in, if I just try hard enough, I can, I can achieve anything. Just like mom always told me, you could be president if you want to, you can do anything you want to do. Uh, that, 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 that concept of letting go and turning this thing over to a higher power. My first higher power was that guy sitting across the table from me telling me to start doing things different. And he led me that way. And there was a couple things going on. One of them was is that guy actually did implant confidence in me that I, that I could trust him, that I could follow him. Now, had I not been able to do that, I don't know if we'd have had a second meeting. The second part of that was is that the position I was in facing a, a, a six to 20-year prison sentence, I fucking needed him to be <laughs> able to give me that hope. I needed it. I mean, that was uh, some of that coming to believe stuff of going, man, I got to push my chips to the middle of this dude's table because I don't think there's anything else that's going to work for me. So as I flip the roll around, I see myself doing the same thing because it's not, it's not bluff. It's real. You know, there was a time when I thought that what happened to me, I was just arrogant enough to think that because this mentor actually was able to deliver this message to me and have me do the work. And I had the miracles happen in my life that he promised would happen and that uh, other promises told me would happen. I was just arrogant enough to think I was special enough that it wouldn't happen for anybody else. Because I am special. Yes, you are. (laughs) The magic really happened when I actually was able to turn it around and start giving it to other guys. And the fluke went away. And the specialness of my thing went away. And uh, as I like to say to some other people when we work these 12 steps and and you see that, 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 that look of doubt in their eyes... Like, this is not going to work for me. And I've actually had people, you know, they say, I hope this works for me. And they, this is not a hope this works. I stole this line from a guy, and he says, uh, this is not a program of some, some get it and some don't. This is a program of some do and some don't. So today as I walk along, that mentor is still important in my life, and I really don't make any decisions today without talking to him. I mean, I will go buy underwear without calling him. But I if hope. it's any, if it's it, if it's any of any real consequence, I didn't know you wore underwear. I do, just not. If it's of any huh? real substance, and if it's any kind of thing, because of that 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 intuition that we start living with, where you start actually being able to kind of be able to operate with some level of confidence under your feet, you know, when I got your this. chest comes up. Well, you know, it's not that really. It's more of like riding on that power that you know we talked in the beginning that we're powerless, right? Well, at a certain point in time, I actually got some power back. You know, the power, I have some power in my life today uh, that I didn't have before. I'm still powerless against alcohol and drugs and certain things and, and situations that are happening in my That's life. That's not like going right to go now. away. That's not going to go away. But I do have some power in my life, and I can walk around with my chest out, and I can know that I can. I have, I have earned a freaking right to breathe oxygen on this planet now, and I always wondered if I really had a right to do that. Mm. Good point. Um not to break in, but I gotta go. Awesome! Man. I gotta go celebrate a birthday with a uh, a sponsee friend of mine. Yeah. Shane gets to go give away a one year chip. Yeah, and my that third is, one. Uh, Our favorite. That, that first year of recovery where you've uh, you've kind of you've got that under your belt is a super special thing, and uh, and it's a super honor. And I know Shane's just tickled to death to even have the opportunity to go. And I actually thank him a lot for stopping in today because he really crammed this into his schedule between some things in order to be here with us. Us. I'm so thanks, very Shane. grateful to be here, and thank you for all the juice. Tell our buddy I'm, Travis that, I'm a, uh, I'm a float out of here. I don't even need to use the elevator. Yeah, I'm all juiced up, man. You, man. Please use the elevator. All right, I'll, I'll do it this time. Thanks, Shane. All right, y'all have a good one. Love y'all. Smitty, I think you had something to add to the uh, equation. Hold on. Smitty's got to get this. Huh? A bad idea either, and I know that's why you did that. I'm almost a little bit. I got to get, first off, I got to do this. Because I was afraid to hear that. <laughs> I don't think. That, yeah, I don't think. I know it's can. oversensitive. Yeah. <laughs> I was reaching it like a fucking like yeah. raccoon, man. And then you know, I, I heard uh, somebody the other day on a podcast, and they go, right. I think, well, it didn't really bother me all that bad. I kept there, listening. Man. Yeah, I kept on listening. Jeez. Yeah, I mean, she was we, hot. We're <laughs> thinking, <laughs> talking about flow jobs. We're today. thinking of these noises are going to be like terrible when really it's just you know it's just natural. Yeah, we know? don't have to play library. Well, well I think thing. we'll get it's, more conversational. It's too not the it's about. not the six o'clock news podcast right. is open up the whole new world. We are allowed right. to occasionally make some weird noises or sound shitty. 
It's okay. Yeah. Well, I'll make some weird noises, all right. And I'll, <laughs> I won't. <laughs> it won't <laughs> and it'll sound shitty, and it'll other things shitty too. It'll. Then we throw in a oh, I love that thing. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, yeah. yeah, I love that thing. <laughs> 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 oh my god! Yeah, I watched one podcast thing today, and a guy he had a thousand dollars of the most dumbest bullshit he bought, thinking he would use when he's doing his podcast. And one of them was a noisemaker thing. Uh, uh, <laughs> there you <yeah>. go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fucking I love that noise. <laughs> 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 I, I like using it at family gatherings. My yeah. dad will like cut a good joke, and I'll be like, <laughs> <laughs> "That's such a great noise." That noise is Smitty's higher power. That's one of my favorite noises. Because <laughs> there was a dude. There was some show uh, that I think it was uh, Cloud. Uh, it was a show about Walmart, but it wasn't Walmart. Oh, and yeah, this I guy would come in and literally make. He wouldn't. He would just make the noise. He would be like, "Yeah, girl, you know what? I'm about to get that diamond ring for you." Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> and that was his like catchphrase. Shane, <laughs> up Shane's leg. I was like, "Who is that?" <laughs> All right, so, so uh, you want to roll again, and I'll bring us back here because we would do be able to do that kind of stuff where you break off, and you know, we may take us five times of sitting down to make a fucking hour. Well, we can. We're still rolling. Yeah, yeah. I figured we're, we can much. just patch it together. Don't act like there's no. Well, like, he, I'll just go off what you were saying. He, he, he didn't even cut it, so... Um, We're rolling. Yeah. Been rolling oh. the whole damn time? It is. I this is free. Minutes with Shane left I feel rolling. betrayed. So right. You know what's bothering me the whole time? I'm looking down at that microphone, and it looked like it was like getting ready to fall off the table. <laughs> that, br- that brings up the whole idea of letting go. You can't let go of the microphone falling off the table. Let's okay. talk about yeah. letting go. <laughs> well, I actually had something that you were talking about earlier. Uh, well, actually, Dan was saying was uh, about... You know how your father figure in your life wasn't that bad a guy, uh, and mine wasn't either. I think the big thing was is I wasn't ready to learn anything. I didn't want him to teach me anything. You know, at, at a certain point, well, not a certain point. Most of my life, I think, because I was the youngest, and my brother uh, was always better than me at everything. So I kind of felt like I didn't. I don't want my dad to teach me anything. I want to just be able to do it, and. Um, because I got sick and tired of being like less than because my brother was, you know, he was just better than me at most things. And so, you know, I wasn't ready to be taught anything. And, you know, if you're not ready to learn anything, then the teacher can't teach you anything. And so I didn't really allow my parents to parent me very much. Good point. And, and later on in life, my brother has taught me a lot of things that I feel like my dad tried to. Uh, it wasn't my dad's fault. It was just the fact that he was dealing with a lot. Of, I mean, you know, it's funny. My, I, 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 anytime I hear the word, word selfish now, I think about the word selfish very differently than I used to. I still think it's a bad thing in a lot of ways. Um, but when my dad used to, my dad used to tell me how selfish I was. And when I was a kid, I just never processed that. I never really thought how selfish I am. And a lot of what I suffer with on a daily basis has to do with my selfishness. And that is key to almost every one of my problems is blowing up every little thing that happens in my life, like a tire popping into like, a, like something that's going to kill me. It's just like these little tiny things that happen in everyday life. If it, dis- if it, if it disrupts my comfort on a daily basis, I'm going to just lose it. And even if I can replay the moment that that happened last time and I didn't lose it, it still happens. And so one of the big things uh, that, that, the pro, that the program, the 12-step program taught me is to realize just how selfish I am. And just that, just the, the awareness of just how incredibly fucking selfish I am. I used to think that selfishness meant you were arrogant. I didn't understand that it could also mean that you think you're the worst person on earth. Um, it basically, selfishness kind of deals with extremes, but... Um, you can think that you're awful and only think about yourself still. Uh, and uh, selfishness is, is something that that I have not conquered in any kind of way. But I have um, plenty of the th- one of the one of the, uh, the the advantages to to this sort of group mentality is I I open myself up to criticism. I will allow my, my good friends to tell me that I'm doing something wrong. I will allow them to tell me, hey, you're full of shit. 
you know, I don't have friends that co-sign for me. They don't go, you know what, man? Yeah, they suck. They'll look at me and say, hey, man, like, maybe you shouldn't have done that. You know, and that's that's real friendship. And that's something that, that I only learned how to do through going through the, the steps. Um, and so that I, I'd like to hear some stuff about selfishness from you guys. You hit that one thing, and I have I get these quotes. This is Dan again. I get these quotes that stick in my head, and I heard this one actually applied to uh, somebody the other day that said, and it goes with this not co-signing your bullshit stuff. This uh, honest conflict is way more valuable than dishonest harmony. When people just tell me I'm okay, you know, because that's part of some of what ended up oh, getting me into that. the mess that I was in to begin with is everybody told me. Uh, and, you know, and, and I'm okay with that concept of, you know, you're okay just the way you are. You know, I'm okay with that at a certain level. But you know what? I wasn't. <laughs> and, and people were telling me I was okay. How many people really are? That, you know, yeah. And, and and then the flip side of that is, you know, if I'm not continuing to do this thing that I was saying earlier about this uh, this add to concept, this continue to grow, uh, our, our, uh, our, our 11 step says that, right? Continue. Or 10 and 11. Continue. The whole thing, the whole last end of it, this is continuing to grow uh, as we as we, as we we walk down this path called life. Uh but you were going to say something about letting go, Nick? Well, I was, but you guys are bringing up interesting topics. Uh, because like you said, with the, the whole last end of the 12 steps, it, the, becoming more spiritual, becoming more aware of a spiritual path it does not make me perfect. I'm going to make more mistakes. But if I have a way to deal with those mistakes immediately, then back to that letting go thing, I can let go of those mistakes almost instantaneously. I have a program set in place. And the word that I've been stuck on lately is mindfulness. Uh, I hear it a lot. Um, one of the meditation is a big part of my life now. And one of the teachers that I subscribe to for meditation, his whole thing is a, a program of mindfulness, being aware that my brain is out of control and being able to step back and look at that. And when I can be mindful of that and I can be mindful of the mistakes I make on a daily basis and wipe that slate clean at the end of the day, let that stuff go, not beat myself up. Because like Smitty was saying about selfishness, part of selfishness is holding on to all the mistakes I've made and using them as a battering ram on myself. That does not make me more spiritual. That does not make me learn. That does not make me better. That makes me feel humiliated. And humiliated usually doesn't do anything good for me. It, it kind of makes me that scared, cornered animal when I start feeling humiliated where I'm bound to strike out with just instinct. And that's never a good thing for me. When I strike out on impulse and instinct, I make big-time mistakes. Um, so to me, finding that way to let go of those mistakes at the end of the day, be mindful of them, that, that's a huge thing for me. That, that breaks my selfishness. Yeah. That mindfulness of being able to actually do what we say in here and not just pretend like we're doing it at night, actually reviewing our day, doing our low inventory, making sure, seeing if we did any damage today. I always say uh, at the end of the day, and I really don't make a lot of, I don't do a lot of damage today with these principles. Now and again, I do. Uh, but but at the end of the day, to be able to, for the most part, some days some days I'm satisfied that at the end of the day I get to put a check mark in the wind column because I didn't hurt anybody today, you know. But I can go back at mindfulness of looking at that. And uh, well, you guys aren't married, so you don't have to make as many amends as I do. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's a whole different. Level I'll probably get to make a couple tonight when I get home. Night's still young. <laughs> Because it is, it's, uh, you know, if I'm sitting and, and I will say this, you know, in my life, I'm sitting alone for the most part and, and I'm with people who I, you know, and, and I'm not saying that God doesn't want to be with his wife. That's all I'm saying. But I can I do, kind of by live the way. in I do. a uh, insulated <laughs> situation when I want it to be that way. Because people generally are the people who bother me, right? The things that bother me. I'm not sitting around getting mad at my stereo. I'm usually not getting mad at my, it's people. It's the guy driving the car that cut me off. It's the... You know, I always, uh, I've got a girl in my life too, and, 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 and she's in and out, in and out, in and out. And she can say things that will click my trigger faster than any other person on life, in life. And, I, and, and something that's been dawned on me lately is, uh, is how quickly I am to give up my power to females. We were talking about that the other day. And, you know, because I like won't, uh, to the guy at work, I will stand tall and I won't give up my power, Right. I will stand up to him. 
but her, when she says something, oh, yes, I'll be right over there. No, that's not what I meant. I meant, you know, and I kowtow and I won't stand up for myself when it comes to a female. And that can even be, that can go all the way down to my 12-year-old daughter, you know. And, and I know there's a certain level of boundaries and things, and, and, and I should be delivering things to her, and I should be a good father, and I believe I am. But there's still boundaries, and you can't just let yourself get rolled over anymore because that ends up rolling back into the thing we were started off with earlier, is that I build resentments with that. And I began to get sick again when I started acting in those in those ways. Yeah, I agree. And sometimes people need need you to stand tall with their shoulders back. They don't need you to come in and swoop in like some sort of masked superhero and fo- solve all their problems. Yeah, I feel like I uh, what we what we struggle with a lot is identity, and identity has a lot to do with like who am I really. And, you know, when you, when you do, when you do the work and do the steps, you kind of find out a little bit, you don't necessarily find out who you are, but you definitely find out who you aren't. And there's certain parts of me that I used to maybe think in the back of my head, this is who I am. It's just who I am, man. You know, when you hear people, especially younger people say, you know, when they respond to criticism with something like, well, this is just who I am. Deal with it. Is it though? Or is it just, that's where you are right now? Or just things that you do. Right. Or just things that you do or, you know. Ha- habits, thought patterns, you know, um, some people are, you know, well, I just, uh, I don't do that. I don't, you know, I've, I've met people who, uh, you know, I've tried to apologize for things and they go, I don't, I don't do apologies. Yeah. And I, and I, and I, you know, I mean, and that's where they're at and I can't change anybody. And a lot of, a lot of what I've learned in, 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 in this whole journey is one of my biggest things is if you just knew what I wanted, everything would be so much better. And uh, I can't change you, though. And, and a lot, you know, uh, Nick, Nick was talking about, you know, this beating myself up for things, you know, and holding on to that stuff. I can't because it, it really isn't me. And if, and if I'm allowing that stuff to, to sort of suspend above me at all times, I'm not going to be able to grow. I have to leave it behind. I can't just say, well, that's who I am. I have to be able to move on and say I can grow. Uh, and the one thing about society these days, I don't want to get too, uh, too broad with, with my, with my words here, but I kind of feel like we don't believe enough in people's ability to change. We assume that because somebody, you know, said something one time, you know, a long time ago that they are, that they are still that person. Um, now I, I don't believe that now, you know. You, you could you could talk about actions as being something else, but saying things, um, you can grow. I've done a lot of gro- growth in my life. I know certain people that uh, that have come a long way in a very short time towards being better people. And if we can't grow, then what's the point in life at all? If we're just assuming, and I, what I like to do is I like to look at people and I, they do something that I don't like, I automatically label them as somebody that sucks and they're an asshole and they're never going to change and they're always going to be like that. But that's because I don't know them. But I can't tell you how many people I've met in my life that I originally found out that, that I thought that I didn't like and then eventually I was like, wow, I was so wrong about them because I, my judgment is so quick. And um, that's another one of my character defects is my my ability to judge everything for my... my uh, my instant, you know, just what goes off in my head. But, uh, I feel like if one of the, uh, one of the, uh, the, uh, the most important things, uh, towards getting any kind of gaining any ground spiritually is realizing that you can change. You, you can, can change your mind. You can change your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you can change the way you view things. You can change the way you view people. It's not doesn't mean the world outside changes. It's the lens through which you see it changes. Which changes first, your thinking or your acting? <laughs> well, thank you for asking me that, Nick. <laughs> I know what you're getting at, but uh, you know, I used to think that if I read the right book, I, I, I remember before I tried to get sober, I read the Dalai Lama's the the Art of Happiness. And you woke up the next day a different person. Well, I didn't read it all. First of all, <laughs> I only not. got I only got about halfway through it, and I was like, "This sounds great," but I don't remember anything it said. 
and I'm not happy. You're probably drinking while you read it. I, probably. I don't remember. <laughs> but but I that was one of my ways. I actually wrote one of the, just to show you what I, just what, what you're dealing with. I actually wrote out a big thing on, on Microsoft Word and printed it out that said, Chris, exercise self-control today. And I would put it by my door. So I could remember, remind myself to be to practice self control, and then I'd go out and get drunk. Um, and I thought that that would help. Uh, but yeah, that's that's the kind of stuff that that uh, where my brain goes. Um, but I'm tangenting a little bit. So. No, so we really are just living action to action. Right. Right. We, uh, the, yeah. The, you said the thing about the talking uh, the action. Uh, I have to act to change my thinking. The thinking doesn't change until I do things to, to, to change my perspective. My pr- perspective won't change by reading something. or and, and just because your perspective changes doesn't mean it's, it's going to stay there. There's a maintenance process to staying in the same mindset. I have a lot of uh, uh, issues with, uh, with food. And one of the things for me is I'll get in a great mindset of doing the right thing, eating the right thing, working out, running, going to sleep on time but as soon as one of those little bits of it goes off my perspective changes and I'm back in that old way of thinking so the action is what keeps me in the thinking and it's not one thing it's not like rehab you don't do it once and then all of a sudden you're changed that's not how my brain works I have to maintenance it to keep operating well if I if I just it's not a one shot thing it's an everyday take your vitamins kind of thing well, that's the difference between like when you were wanting to like read a book, and I'm and I've still can find myself falling into that trap of wanting to like absorb information and think it's somehow going to make me better. Now I might absorb new information and learn something and, and gain some knowledge that I didn't have before, but it didn't really do anything to me. Got to put and that's the action. thing about the twelve steps is there's action in that step work that actually causes you to go through and do concrete, tangible actions. It asks you to sit down and do this. And then you go somewhere and you sit down with a guy and you have a conversation and you do this. And it actually is concrete stuff. And what was Chris was saying about the, the uh, doing it once thing is we continue to do this multiple times over our lifetime uh, to continue because if we stagnate, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of lines and a lot of quotes in, in, in the book that those 12 steps come out of. Uh, initially, but uh, that resting on our laurels and, and, and sitting around uh, holding back uh, I can't do that. I know today that, uh, that I have to continue to take actions, and those particular 12 actions are ones I need to do in a cycle throughout my life, and, and how often you do it's one thing, but, but I know that I need to continue to do it because I continue to build up new stuff as I go down the path. And I'm, you know, like we were saying, I can't not change today. You're going to change. I don't care what you do. You can sit still. If I sit in that corner over there and didn't do anything, I'm going to change if I get up and I do something, I'm going to change. What I need to do is get my trajectory in a change that I would say uh, yoga has taught me this term. is It starts beginning to get me aligned with my true north. It starts getting me pointed in a direction that which I should be going. And I can tell that inside intuitively because after having a little, uh, like a bit, uh, Bill Wilson, one of the co-founders of the 12 Steps, said uh, in one of his letters that he wrote, Having had a little spiritual development, he could now, so I was used that once in a while, having had a little bit of spiritual development, my moral, and it's, that's not a good word either because I don't think this is morals, but we'll just use that. My compass, my internal compass, my intuitive compass writes itself easier today because I know when I'm going off course. I didn't used to really, well, I didn't really used to know it or I would hide it from myself. Today, I know when I'm going off course and I can correct that today using these tools and reaching out to people and having those mentors around me. And another good thing is, is a lot of times, as long as I stay in contact with that mentor on a regular basis, he can kind of keep a thermometer in my mouth and keep a, keep a, keep a, my temperature. He can see if I'm getting a fever or not. He knows before then, you do yeah, sometimes. He can say, hey, uh, Dan, uh, you might want to inventory that. You might want to do another, uh, maybe you might want to inventory that and do a six and seven, see if you don't have an amends to do there. And, and, and have that guy kind of watching over me that, uh, that, that can kind of keep me on the rails. I mean, this is no, to me, it's no different than just about anything else in life. If you stop doing the action, then you get rusty. 
You know, if I mean you're it's a bow, a you're, skill. you're you're a bow hunter. What happens if you take two years off from shooting your bow? If I take a few months off, I lose right. Skill. Right, I'm a chef. If I stop cutting, I mean, now I've started to get to where I'm in management, and I go stand next to my number one guy and try to cut things, and he cuts circles around me. Yeah, you know, because I don't I don't do that every day. Yeah, you're right anymore. So the more actions I take on a day to day basis, the more finely honed those tools are, and that goes. Across that's the board. We, that's why we say practice. Yeah. We got to continue to practice this stuff in our lives. And and given my, I will lose momentum if I don't have guys around me doing the same thing too. That's just a little bit of a peer pressure thing that actually works for me. You know, at one point in my life, peer pressure was a negative effect in my life because I let myself follow people who were doing things that were, uh, I, I said, that were taking me down paths I shouldn't be going. Uh, and, and, and you know at some level I had I knew that but it was still fun so there was some pleasure to be had there you well, now I've got blaming them for taking got, you down the now, path yeah now I've got this group of folks around me that are actually doing the opposite this group of folks that are on this trajectory of trying to grow and wanting to do better for each other and you know and to have like this brotherhood that I have around me today uh, at times I will be like explain trying to explain to people what it means to have a friendship and a in a brotherhood that I have today. And I will tear up telling them because I know, like, you know, I told a guy the other day sitting there talking uh, at, at work, you know, I said, I know. See, one of my buddies works in that building right there. And if I needed him right now, he would be here. <laughs> and the same goes back and forth. And I said, you know, I got friends that will come and actually help me today. And I got enough that, you know, I don't have, it's a, it's a surplus, right? You know, so I'm not going to run to the end of that list and everybody's busy. It's an embarrassment you know, of riches. It will not happen. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, having that, we said, uh, tribe around me. I am I am now today with my tribe. Well, I think we're going to have to just uh, plant a flag in this conversation for tonight. Good topics, good... Uh, this Smitty makes fun of me over there. I'm going to inventory that real quick. Um, he just made me feel less than. Uh, but, oh, you know, buddy. <laughs> that's, that's about all the time we have for tonight, guys. I really appreciate the conversation. Believe it or not, for those out you out there listening, these kind of conversations help me become more spiritual. And uh, so I'm, I'm excited to have them with you guys, and I look forward to next time. Yeah. Been rolling the uh, whole damn time. It is. It's just free. Minutes with Shane left I feel betrayed. Rolling.